service will lead the growth. Thinking on the medium term in uh, potential growth, services for information and communication will trigger the growth. So growing a lot. And this, and this is uh, for transportation as well. Transportation is above the, the threshold because of the logistics created in Brazil. The main items in this resurvey and they showed a permanent growth. Well, in these sectors, the pandemic brought a constant growth. These sectors will now go back to the previous levels. Only automobiles and services show 2% in growth for next year. I won't talk about this. There is a this argument about and uh, this is uh, active population or the labor force. You will see that in proportion in the uh, overall population. You see that pandemic show 2.2 percentages in this scenario increase the amount of people above 15 years old in Brazil. In the right table, there is uh, jobs, formal jobs. Uh, we see that we cannot uh, rely on the information, the formal information, but the, in terms of jobs, it improved fastly. In, not only the uh, official labor force, but also the informal. There was fast, uh, a fast recuperation. Data showing a fast uh, recovery. Well, today this uh, dropped. We do it monthly, even there are uh, labor markets coming back to action or underestimating, being underestimated, the, uh, the employment rate is coming back to the rates before COVID. Now, this is a general under, overall, uh, an overview you see a monetary policy that is tighter. Also the situation in China reflects here and the this uh, anticipation of the monetary tightness and also increase of the interest rates and inflation harming the overall situation. These are, this is a simulation of the trajectory of the GDP, when we think about the uh, supplementary pension, well, forecasts are very conservative, uh, slick in terms of seven, and inflation rate converging to average is still in the level of adaptance in terms of 100%. In my simulations, we did, uh, didn't increase, add this here. There is an issue of uh, revenue with royalties, the end of the trade off or the clearances that will be performed. And this uh, alternate, this uh, simulation shows oscillations in terms of the real interest rates because next year we have a period of election. So it's sad that the land, the uh, overall is bad and indebtedness is 80% uh, 
of the GDP and it will end up in terms of 7%. But I think 100% of the surprise comes from the shock of relative pricing. So the IGP rate is in terms of 80%. There was not in change in uh, the uh, rates of taxation, what we had that the nominal GDP will grow in terms of 20% in terms of the deflection, the deflectors will, will, there will be challenging years ahead. We know how we, the following years in terms of commodity prices drop or rise and you will have challenging times for the future years, showing that these uh, structure, there was a beneficial aspect is leaving aside the human uh, losses, but in terms of macroeconomics, I see a beneficial uh, turn uh, off, uh, trade off, but but what is left is a high bill and what we'll have to pay, what we see in terms of indebtedness. And so we'll see this, how much it will end up and how much we will lose in growth. But there is a space for our errors is slow in this world of high interest rates. This, if this accelerates in the US beyond the curve, this will be an impact in Brazil and in the interest rate and how these tables will show worst situations or condition. What I will conclude here is that the economic situation in Brazil will be more challenging and with a higher inflation in the world, higher interest rate rates in the world was something that came up in the, during the crisis is the logistics and will be having a, a great share in the GDP, but it is a challenge in terms of uh, taxation a survival we never think in long term we should but we have to take this in mind so that's my presentation thank you fernando genta your presentation was very clear for us there is a coordination uh, message. There will be a raffle of agenda and uh, it's already available for everyone. Okay, if you want to be part of it, okay? So there will be also Mauricio now with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paulo. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Fernando, Paulo. authorities in this subject. So let me share my screen with you to, to do my presentation. My speech is going to basically be about a supplementary pre, um, pension when it comes to public policy and the recent delivery and the future view. Okay. Yes, I see it in full screen. Exactly, exactly, it is, exactly. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go to the first slide. What I wanted to call attention um, to everyone here is that when we would discuss social security, why do the countries formulate public policies for the private social security. It may seem obvious, but it's important for us to understand what is the main objective of a state. 
for doing this entire organization uh, around this subject. So offering this tax incentives, uh, we need to understand what is the purpose of that to not deviate the main purpose. So we need to, uh, in, before we find the answer of that, we need to understand what is the demographic dynamic and what is the market trend, the labor market trend that needs to be more flexible to when it, com when it comes to pressuring the public systems of social security because they usually pressure us very much because on one side we have the retired on one side, of course, this is good, but it need, it leads to many debts, public debts. And on the other hand, we also have the active workers, the ones that are, are setting the scenario for the future and the generation of, of active people. So we have a market a place that has more and more people. We can see, for example, um, this makes the social security, the public social security uh, in need of reforms. And what does that mean? Decreasing the benefits and also changing the mentality for those who retire. So we need to look at how this, when this constitution was elaborated, the public, the social security paid uh, 36 uh, salaries of contribution in the 36 uh, years that of contribution. So it's the average of your last years of work. So your standard of uh, of pension would not be, would not drop so much of what you have received before. There was the 9899 reform. I'm not going to consider your 36 uh, years, but I'm going to consider 80% of your best income. And now in 2003, we had the end of the entirety or the parity of your salary. And this was extinguished in the last reform two years ago. The public and the private sector um, said that the average was going to be now, the, everyone is going to receive 100% of all of the contributions that were received throughout the years. So uh, that was now going to be the rule. And all of this tends to drop the standard, uh, the life standard of the person that has been working. And the entire world has um, started receiving a basic income, basically. And in this context, the private social security started to have more importance and people started investing in that. And that is the main answer. Why do the countries also talk about this? And this is this seems obvious, but we cannot run away of this objective that is uh, there. So it's not about having an instrument and a support before the retirement, but it's avoiding this drop, this great drop in this uh, life standard uh, when the person retires. And we cannot forget uh, about what is the main objective of this when we um, try to really foster this uh, change, it needs to be related to the long term. For example, when you are 40, 60 years old, you're able to make this uh, public debt a little bit more um, able to be f f um, divided in different projects throughout the years so that the country is able to pay for that. And any public policy, being uh, the um, education, health, or the social security reform, we need to evaluate if the quality of this public policy is adequate and if it's being able to uh, support the 
the target group that is going to be promoted. So when we talk about the developed countries, the advantage of the person that is uh, being helped and, and promoted in the end is that, for example, I'm not paying taxes right now uh, to contribute uh, to the social security, but I'm going to pay for it later. Yes, but once again, it's not yours. You have only a, a small amount of this in the end. In the same way, the liquid that you are going to receive in the end um, is going to be uh, what the government has invested both in education, health, and in other areas. And the quality of the public policies is really recent. And we always need to analyze that. So with that said, we understand uh, now why the countries formulate these uh, changes. And I'm not going to talk about the strategic plan of the CNPC uh, from 2020 to 2022. So with the this change in the closed segment, with the several discussions that uh, talk about social security, we used three axes, the promotion, the governance supervision, and the improvement of the legal framework. So with the promotion, we I'm going to highlight the financial education and technology and governance and supervision. I'm going to talk about the harmonization, the open and closed harmonization and the uh, improvement of the legal framework. I'm going to talk about the law, the norms uh, 108 and 109. So talking about the first pillar, the financial education and technology. Until now in, the, in our website, we have, for example, ways of promoting uh, the financial education and technology. And here is the answer. The Secretariat of Social Security delivers the forum, uh, the Brazilian Forum of Financial Education that uh, started in June last year to start thinking about how this uh, financial education would take place, creating an exclusive unit of financial education for private social security and that is focused uh, focused in private pension and in this while we the secretary of, of social security launched uh, several educational materials um, like this two that are down below and they are specific for the financial education from 2020 and 2021 promoting several webinars, several elections in partnership with the public sector and the private sector, the program, uh, financial well-being, the Global Money Week, and also the National Financial Education Week. So go into the short answer that you can see here in the chat. Yes, that's it. We need to start really spreading out to the different municipalities, the states, all of the materials that we have, trying to uh, promote in our communities this financial education. It's, it's a generation work that we need to go through. And the state is articulating itself more and more with this program of financial well-being, like I said, and Previki, for example. The Secretariat of Social Security also launched a, a behavioral econ, um, economic uh, guide, and it's available in our website. This guide gives a provocation to the different entities to start thinking about other ways using technology to attract more people uh, in regards to the subject. So it's like uh, providing um, a, a, an environment where people feel the need of increasing their knowledge when it comes to tech to financial education. So more and more, we do the qualitative and quantitative analysis of this person that is going to participate in with a lot more knowledge than he had before. And it's going to be um, very good. So now let's go to the next one. This was the first pillar of the ax a second pillar of the axis, uh, governance and supervision. So I evaluate here that we have advanced a lot when it comes to uh, open and closed harmonization. We have this debate to talk about the open and closed uh, segment. 
we already talked about a little uh, about the differences that they had, and we need to go hand in hand with uh, both of them because we know that they are both important. We have several values that are different between one and the other, but it's when it comes to taxation, it can be more um, equal for people to even f understand how this works in Brazil. The Social Security uh, Secretariat has uh, done several partnership with regulatory agencies and uh, it discusses deeply all of this plan plans, these different rules in a practical way. It, we already have uh, fruitful um, outcomes fr from this. So, for example, we have the rules uh, uh, of the plan, uh, plan rules that we have investment policies and uh, a way to harmonize different segments of the open and closed segment. So we also launched a statistic panel with a new version of the man, uh, managerial report of the supplementary uh, social security or supplementary pension that can help us think how to do this even better with time. So. To end the improvement of the legal framework, uh, like we said before, with the open and closed segments, because we know that they are complementary and they rule, they have different rules. We have a, a great work to be done by the different secretariats, uh, and they have delivered, for example, two initiatives, uh, capital initiatives. They were able to implement this uh, two complementary laws, 108, 109. And I hope that this is reviewed in the Congress to really simplify and flexibilize uh, the, the rules uh, in the, for the public and private uh, servers. And also we have been working with different norms uh, to make this simple and revoking 32 resolutions and 12 um, pr uh, processes that exist. So uh, talking, focusing on the federal entities, we have uh, done several actions throughout the country. Um, as we all know, the social security reform was uh, something that was going to help aid this process of implementation and uh, they needed to, for example, reach more than 2,000 municipalities and cities, and it's been accelerated with time. And the Secretary of Social Security has entered this agenda uh, with um, explanatory materials uh, with five different editions that are in our website. And we already see 680 uh, federal entities that have approved these laws that instituted the RPC. We have 39 uh, entities with this uh, private social security plan that is already ongoing and 86, uh, 8.6 uh, billion uh, reais in uh, patrimony. So this is going to ex be accelerated at the end of the year. We're gonna see this more and more and when it comes to the subject. As I have uh, talked about the deliveries that we've had, we can talk about the future. Uh, so our view, our vision of the future is the following. We are want to increase the cover, the coverage of the uh, savings that we have in the social security for among the workers. Nowadays, we have a taxation and we are trying to study the expansion of this uh, taxation incentives uh, for the employees that have um, profit regimen that is uh, around the nas Simples Nacional. It's, um, we are going to only see the results of this um, throughout the time. And we're going to evaluate these products, not only with the incomes of the closed segment, but also the open one. We have 84% of these contributions in the plan. 
and we want more and more Brazilians to have access to this. And we need to uh, follow all these different agendas to be able to reach that. So, for example, in Brazil, the employers that have this taxation incentive now, they are only the bigger companies that declare the um, the real profit, and the smaller uh, companies, um, they are the companies that employ the majority of the population in its totality. So they have already an access uh, in a different way. And different entities of the government can uh, find a way to, to, to a way out to help uh, this uh, target audience. And we need to redesign uh, this procedure as well so that we can reach uh, the simple and the poor layers of the society. So we already can see the different, 85% uh, of the contributions uh, in uh, of these uh, social security come from citizens that have um, a salary, uh, seven minimum wage or more and they are not able to use this money because they do not understand what is the advantage of this. So we need to work on that and evaluate a product that can also only um, uh, be, be used for those people that don't declare their income tax tax and a product that can uh, only provide 47% of the values that were paid it makes a lot more sense. So new products and technologies for us to reach more Brazilians. We need to study these new products. So we have in our agenda, this collective plans and different studies that we can uh, do with new products for autonomous workers, for example. And in this channel, it's much easier to understand what they need. We need to hear from them so that the worker that is in a company, for example, can access this collective plan. So studying these new products uh, uh, regarding autonomous workers, freelancers, we are going to have a, a lecture in a presentation just about uh, freelancers uh, without deepening too much about this. How can we uh, tackle all of these people and other modelings of this plan? With Jose Alfonso, we are also going to have the, our British um, a speaker who is going to talk about this new modeling of social security. So stay with us, follow along. We are, we'll show what's happening here and see what, ha what is happening in the world and see if we can absorb these ideas and raise this, um, security or security uh, understanding or I mean supplementary pension regime and people start to see a way to plan for the future, revisit the rules of vesting, accountability, in the amount of time that the employer demands to and to study new policies for the the market of uh, in, income market it, which is, is still low here if we can accumulate if we want to generate income uh, the many people do not understand this. To promote and reduce the administration costs, 
but one percent in uh, administration uh, rate is too much so to be better applied and there's the issue of innovation that we must be aware we invited Suzette to talk about open insurance and how this gets to our world we foster the use of simulators so people can at least one once a year understand what's the uh, the expected income a program for education and revise the policies uh, harmonizing the resolutions so uh, all of this it's a lot to develop if you have any doubt you can put uh, your question in the chat we have time we'll answer it thank you mauricio congratulations for the presentation i'll pass the floor for to lucio capelletto from previki but we have to go faster due to time so uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here i'll try to go fast and like thank you paulo valle you have participated here at previc that i'm headed in and also share the panel with Mauricio and Fernando and congratulate Ronaldo Rolim for his uh, important messages. So talking about Previc, Mauricio has uh, tackled in, uh, in general ways. Genta talks about the macroeconomics and I will talk about our supplement about supplementary pensions and i have this presentation well thinking about supplementary pension we have uh, the open uh, entities and the listed entities like fund and, uh, pension funds under the uh, supervision of Previc. If we think about the listed companies or the listed funds, almost uh, 100 billion, billions over 1,100 plans. All these entities are managers of plans with the uh, finance of the government or uh, private sectors with a population of 7.9 million people and the other four millions are the people that are designated as participants and assisted like uh, retired people or uh, purpose people that receive the pension funds well the benefits paid per year reaches 70 billion reals it pays more than it receives we have over 3,300 sponsors but there are other uh, regimes other systems and we see in the world in brazil will still have a long way to go in terms of supplementary pension well we'll see in the table the 28 percent uh, here in 2019 to 26 percent if we think about that denmark 220 percent of the gdp so brazil still has a lot to reach thinking about the active population we have the same 13 percent re regarding the gdp and we still have compared to denmark still a long way to gain as already mentioned 
Maurice said about the flexibilization and modernization or updating the rules in terms of harmonization and uh, or, or fostering it changes some uh, regulations according to the constitution and we are working upon it so we are looking forward to a sustainable growth the protection of these um, supplementary pension and the efficiency thinking on think about brazil and fernando tackle it in a very proper way i bring here some indicators that are important to understand what is happening with the pension funds and the pension plans here if we think about uh, the interest rates in 2018 2019 it's dropped and even the silic rate was also dropping reaching to two percent and now is starting a process of growth the ex uh, the in Ibovespa crisis of COVID it presented a steep drop but for the last quarter also a drop and the exchange rate that came from four to five point six reais a leap by the end of uh, 2019. Why is this so important? If we think about the asset, the variation of one percentage point, it means 10 million AI. So this affects the risks that we hold in the pension funds. The risks in terms of assets are common to all plans. Everything is uh, defined benefits contributions there are variation in the financial assets common to all plans the liquidity risk we went through the crisis with no problems in paying the benefits during this term so this is positive and the credit risk still small within the the system but still it deserves an, uh, a very uh, accurate analysis to uh, better classify it. And the ASG risks get gained traction, which means in social, environmental, and governance risk, which will be important. 80% already contemplate in its policies in their policies on investments the main norm is 4.661 of investments which is the major rule in terms of internal controls or in risks segregation this is for assets as for liability there is operational risks there are operational risks, labor or uh, taxation. In terms of actual risk specific for uh, the plants, we are talking about defined benefits. There are the risk of uh, interest rates and index say, indexation. If we think about the inflation rate of 10%, it means a uh, 15 percent of variation of the liability in terms of longevity in, in the rates when there are for a longer period the contribution must be higher and the modeling rules that was mentioned by Mauricio in terms of contributions in 100 percent and in the past was lower in other benefits change the liability of these uh, defined benefits plans 
Well, in terms of resolution 30, it deals with this. Thinking about our uh, regime, our system, it, it is matures. Uh, oh, 90 percent of the plans are assisted and the rest in the accrual part and the CVs and CD plans are still are already playing the benefit, paying the benefits. If we think about the future, the con defined contribution plans, they are not open. They are closed. They are open are more complex due to the risks. And all of this takes us to think about the future, the plans of the fund contribution. There is a concentration in terms of uh, uh, federal bonds, public bonds or Brazilian bonds. When the interest rates will reduce and we still see a diversification, it's not because it uh, was rate, it will uh, mean a diversification. It's not recommendable. We have policies for investments. The actions uh, according to the shares of the funds with uh, shares in participations in private equity, in public uh, bonds, uh, private bonds and, uh, and that present risk in credit. The real estate funds also operations with participants and others, especially from abroad. But within this uh, framework to, to it, we have a uh, concern with robust governance, internal, inefficient controls and efficient risk management. We are working on based on these three pillars and regarding the norms to strengthen the system, but re looking for its uh, perenniality. In terms of monitoring, we implemented changes and we improved our process with uh, better monitoring with uh, economic financial indicators that are monthly uh, acquired and also uh, many informations uh, uh, coming from databases and identification of anomalous situations that imply risks and we take action to improve the quality and have this risk analysis monthly in terms of uh, assessment of uh, uh, qualitative we want to assess the internal controls if they are compatible to it, their activities. We are doing analysis and assessments. We are defining the dates to provide the gradings for the entities and we'll show the weak points and the strong points. In terms of uh, economic, uh, financial, and actual evaluation, we apply these indicators, the uh, investments, credit, and for governance, we, it is related with all the uh, state entities. We hope to have this matrix that will be part of the quantitative analysis also with the qualitative and will end with a final grading for the plans. Well, this reinforces what I always say to improve the situation of uh, these operations performed by the entities. We have this range and depthness in terms of supervision. There is a institutional relationship through the creation of the ministry. Uh, the Previki was reallocated uh, since August. 
we have relationship with the central bank, the Fed, the, the and other federal spheres, and also internationally speaking, with the institute that the institution that gathers the supervisors of pension funds. As I said, and we have uh, many discussions on it. Well, we civil society, we have publications. We tried the, at, we tried hard to provide all the transparency with all the issues, the surveys, the reports of the supplementary pension position. Everything is available in our website. Finally, we see the growth of participants like the federative entities participating, also the people receiving or having the chance of having, having it. And due to the demands and requirements, we have to take into account and deliver a good product. Harmonization of the applicable rules to the, to the system of pension, supplementary pension. Diversification of asset allocation is a trend. There are There is a concentration in public bonds and the intensive use of technology and cooperation of innovations that our newcomers demand in terms of better products. Well, Paulo, thank you for your attention and of all of you. Thank you, Lucio. Time is always short. I think the presentations of the three speakers I know well the good quality of Previc, of Supici, also uh, thank Fernando Genta. Now, as a secretary of National Treasury, I part of this uh, landscape. I, agree with Fernando Genta's analysis a really good uh, improvement, a good recovery for in uh, thinking about the fiscal year concern, the size of the pandemic and the levels before the crisis that still uh, that it took place the deterioration in that started in 2014. Now we have this big challenge after or post pandemic. This is a concern in terms of inflation worldwide. This increases the interest rates. And in our side, it is to keep a taxation policies that is forecastable and is stable. I see that the market acknowledges it. it, although there is the impact of inflation, part of was uh, collected is, was due to this activity. Now we have to take in concern the short and medium term, also the elections in next year. What is discussed now is the importance to keep this um, cap policy that was created in 2016 to keep the expenses or the budget under control. This cap of expenses is uh, also corrected by IPCA. With the recovery of the collection, we have these figures and ensure the sustainability. Well, there is this pack for the caps, the propositions by the government, including two teams, an increase with the expenses of what we call the precatorios, which means 
which are 60 percent so the government proposed to bring the same methodology of cap for uh, these uh, debts uh, that uh, was expanded in 2016. We see that what we say there are precatories, these debts, the payment of the debt that was applied during the 90s. To in the second point, the methodology of the caps that changed the term of uh, in of the term from June to June, July. Now it's January to December with uh, 60 billion which is the anticipation for the following years. We still have this gap. This is still being discussed at the Congress. And we hope that this will be approved this beginning of December. And we'll have a clear understanding that we'll have to leverage our policies we we believe in a reduction of the interest rate and monetary policies the central bank is independent and can control the inflation rate well i would like to to end to our, our panel we have a short time i will pass the floor to you because there are many questions. I try to combine them all. You answer the question and do your final words. So we'll have six minutes. For Genta, oh, well, sorry, uh, I'm being very straightforward. And the first question about the need to this diversification with increase of interest rate and stratification. The doubt is how much should be worked upon and the anxiety on the challenges of accruing in a scenario of a reduced uh, average income when the person will face the, the challenge. To Maurizio, there are many questions in terms of priorities for the future years, but the presentation was very clear. So the main question is the challenge that will be for the entities among the two kinds of entities. And there is uh, this question for the, the, for Lucio, these policies in England, in England or a United Kingdom, has to take into account the climate changes in its policy. Is there anything similar in Brazil? I'll pass the floor to Fernando Genta and then Mauricio and Lucio. Thank you for your participation. Well, well, about the interest rates, I believe there are two different words, worlds. So when we talk about this here, we think about the income and the um, is, is statutory actuary. And so in Chispe, we see this relationship and how this is so challenging with so many um, challenges that we face. I think that the rates, they vary a lot. What we have been seeing here is what we are going through as well. The balance that we're going to find tomorrow, for example, 
the formal um, market that we have, they uh, only get the minimum wage, but the income of the majority of the families is frozen and there is nothing we can do about it. But we are looking at the scenario with an aliquot in January for the minimum wage to continue basically the same. There is no space for them to uh, provide a, an, in, an increase in that income to bring um, a balance to the macro scenario. So we have been seeing, for example, that we have these changes in prices and the minimum wage. There's something that we, we need as well. Thank you, Paulo. So we have uh, this raffle in the chat once again. So uh, everyone that is ready, we can do that. So our friends here, they are going to help us. The question was really broad. And the it takes a while. And um, and we have Finatec, Abrapi. We have Central Bank and all of this. We can do a harmonization and understand the scenario. We work with this reference of inspiration. And uh, what we're going to have here is a change. And when we think about any other policy, we observe different principles and we are able to look for other areas of understanding in this point. We need to search more and look for more evidence. About the, um, this question, when it comes to climate change, we work in the environmental, social change, and the resolution 8.2, it contemplates different investments and different criteria that were analyzed in this scenario. So the transparency about this can be done this way. I think that the other questions that we have, so it was clarifying in this uh, sector. And I would like to thank my friends for all their work and all of their friendship for all these years. Thank you so much for this invitation to participate in the panel. Thank you so much. We thank the panelists for the excellent presentations and moderation, and we invite them to participate here with us in the seminar. For those who are watching us and had questions that were not answered, please send them to CPC in the chat. Once again, at this moment, we're going to have um, the raffling of the agendas, and I'm going to tell you who won the raffle, okay? And the winners are and Ana Marcia. 
cadastrado para entrega das agendas. Parabéns. We are going to talk to you by email to deliver you the this agenda. Now we're going to have an institutional video from Abrapt. Formalization is very high. Going through the simplified taxation systems and and among the independent workers, there are high income qualified uh, uh, people. It's not uh, app delivery people or Uber drivers or app drivers, it's another world, in specifically Brazil, is at the forefront in, compared to other economies and societies. It's important to say that this was a trend already before the pandemic. It was giving its first steps and these trends were consolidated. As we can see, we are having this conference remotely, digitally, and not physically. This is not a circumstance, but it's a new normal, as everybody says. It means that we need to redesign a new social pact or agreement, but in Brazilian case is 
deeper in terms of need. And so we think the social protection away from the idea of a job, a formal job and wages, as it is seen worldwide after the Second World War. The uncertainties are higher. And at the same time, we are seeing a strong increase in savings, in precautionary savings. So this is the challenge to change this uh, savings of the fear of fear of the future to move into uh, something that is more uh, beneficial to the whole country. We have a legislation to protect the uh, the, the saver, especially in Brazil, linked to investments. All of this, in my opinion, means to have new public policies as well as economic and social ones, and above all, formulated and put into practice transparently. I will go through my uh, this presentation is available. I will uh, translate this into data and you can access to my presentation after the uh, meeting. There are trends already established post pandemic world more than ever. There is economy, economy digitalization as well in this society unprecedented reallocation of the production, the industrial world, and it started with the fans in the past, uh, those hospital ventilators in the beginning of the pandemic. So every country is reassessing all of it. So among, in the midst of all this, there is the independent or the autonomous worker. It's a company that is hiring or um, establishing a agreement of uh, work with a person that has a company uh, as if it was a, lay, uh, a, a job. This doesn't go for every profession, but there is this uh, independent work trend. It is being done breaking uh, the limits of the geographies of the world. And we have also the digital nomads, and that is a, a strong reality taking place in some countries. I live in Portugal and I can see on the streets uh, every day, those that are uh, working and, and living and working, maybe uh, working for an American company, rendering services for Vietnam and, the, and ending up all in China. How can say about the stabilization or the future or of this kind of worker. Being a German, temporarily living in Portugal. So all of this means that we have more uncertainties than insurances or certainties of the world. The only thing we know that the past will not repeat itself. This digital nomad represents this. There is no formal job with the documentation. There is no wages. There is no contribution for social security. So it is something that will take place in Brazil. So we need new social contracts. The new technologies everyone knows is automation that generates unemployment, but on the other hand, generates new qualifications, new skills, new professions. Many of them even have not been created yet. We're talking about skills and not about education. 
uh, it is necessary to learn develop yourself and answer to the needs of the new world and all of these that we are talking we, it resumes that automation is stronger in the service sector than in the uh, plants that were already automated it's uh what is being substituted is a machine by a robot so taking this in consideration what we are talking is where we could uh, see in the brazilian case well qualified and well paid workers are being more affected by this technological reallocation we have data here when we state uh, and say talk about the brazilian condition it's not new it's part of our economy already few countries in the world if we could observe uh the natural person income tax uh would see those that have properties or own companies or is a worker in the private sector there is 1.3 uh employee to one employer what we're talking about those that uh supply the income tax as a natural person as a person we'll not talk about the informal workers or the less qualified with lower uh, income that do not do the income tax uh, statement so among these uh, world of 30 million people that do the income tax statement there is uh, there's a great amount of people that own their own jobs and work in uh, companies if he is a uh, jobless work does not have social security benefits well i always say and talk to our friends one what is clear and needed to know more in brazil the number of uh, business owners contribute paying pro labor or the uh, specific amount of money for their own expenses well there are empirical data that these owners state a small amount uh one minimum wage and the rest is collected as profit which means there is no contribution for the social security and, and greater part of the income for this person is uh, like this. And the what he, I'm saying is that what people is uh, getting and stating that is profit, it's not like that. It's in, indeed is uh, the payment for the work done as business owners there are statistics and what was seen that was affected by the pandemic if there is no uh labor link no labor contract and if we think that there is a strong drop of the number of work autonomous works there are still very small companies and micro entrepreneurs being uh, open in Brazil. But this became a escape valve to become minimally formalized and contributing to social security. This is something really new and to be explored in opposition to other Latin economies these workers well there's a, this huge universe of people 
uh, combining the super well qualified and paid workers in IT, in the, uh, in the IT as to the uh, workers in the plant floor or taxi drivers choose to have this kind of situation. Uh, and I see that the majority of the workforce in the hair beauty saloons and want to have this situation called May micro entrepreneur, individual micro entrepreneur contributing with the minimum possible amount for social security and being legalized. So it's after a decade of a uh, steep dropped in terms of formal workers or occupied workers there are those with less uh, uh, contracts and more and more uh, micro entrepreneurs well going back to the uh, app workers Many times it is uh, applied as a way to add uh, more income in the household. We see this comparison in Brazil different from the rest of the world that is a greater proportion of app workers that has as this income as major source of income. As I said, I was concerned with uh, my time, how there is a strong uh, entrepreneurship in Brazil, become the uh, business owners, demand and credit and want to be, have uh, courses, education to improve their own education. And this trend was, did not diminish during the pandemic or after the COVID. It, on the opposite, it increased. So there was um, improvement of this autonomy, which we talked about in an independent appreciation of the autonomy a great trend to really appreciate the personal autonomy, being it a choice of work and the management of the finance. The flexibility many uh, talk about uh, positively and, and the flexibility, the power of choosing the time and the place of work and the power of doing direct activities, maybe that sometimes can offer arrangements that can be um, found in the irregularity of income. And the characteristic of the freelancer is that they do jobs and, and projects every now and again. We need to start thinking about a way of assuring rights to this new model of work, to this new type of worker that um, less and less have their jobs with a um, minimum wage or a way of receiving a paycheck always uh, uh, with a signed license and uh, the way that they can generate many things at one time sometimes can be faster but the economy doesn't know how to improve the income of all of these people there are new trends that we need to know and we have looked in our particular case for different possibilities different understandings to make uh, align the sustainability and the entire life cycle of the social security norm. The new normal is very complex, very volatile, very ambiguous, and very uncertain. 
the innovation of products, processes, and communications is the concept of VUCA and the need for institutionalities that have to do with this mitigation of uncertainties maybe can be being the new project um, of law that we have been providing now for the clients and the participants of this type of um, social security standards. So the closed or the open social security means having new processes, new ideas, new ways of managing it. So these transformations, parts of them, are administrative, managerial. So in particular, we already have been positioning ourselves in this way, and the expansion is stronger and stronger. And this work plans that we have in the closed entities. So we need to know how to keep that in a different way. So giving more security to the ones that we uh, have here. I'm going to skip this data here and just highlight some new suggestions. The law of protection uh, to the worker, even those who have, for example, an income, they still uh, don't receive enough. So they have an income that is not um, have the, the, has nothing to do with the social security. They do not uh, contribute as taxpayers as an a, a risk preventer. So what we deduct now of in in our private sector. A part of its this phenomenon has is something curious. When we do our deduction, for example, a sixteen percent when we declare the income tax, for example, and that one that contributes with the income tax, they have a small part of their income, which is able to be uh, deducted. And the same phenomenon happens in the health area and the health area. So those are phenomenons that are different and distinct among themselves. They contribute to the social security and they cannot use everything that they have contributed with. And that is proportional, for example, to what we have in the Brazilian case. So the potential would be if in the uh, in instead of contributing and de de deducting from that income, sometimes we could ex stimulate these workers who receive a salary and we could contribute for example, from all of these employees, 
And in my point of view, that is generalized by these entrepreneurs that are receiving this profit. A part of them would be receiving even less than they contributed with. And they're benefited by this exemption, but they don't have any stimulation to deduct that. So it doesn't help in what we are trying to talk about in the Brazilian economy. We still have a lot of potential and we have some slides here of the pandemic. And in some other cases, for example, we have the increase of the savings. And with the pandemic, we are able to have a part of the population not consuming much. And you are able to see this reality in the society in Brazil is not behind. We have some indicators that show that, for example, you could spare part of your income and uh, keep 15% of what you had the year before. So you can save more than you had before. This phenomenon is given because who has done more and more uh, income the year before are the ones that respond to a big part of the Brazilian economy. And this means, in my opinion, that we have, for example, savings that can be qualified in different chains that are covered in a short term. So this is the moment that we needed to join short and long term to make this transition that could stimulate the improvement of this financial point of view and also social policies. Although they are more qualified, they are workers that are staying in, at the margin of what is the official social security standard. So I don't have a lot more time to talk about this, but it would help us to gain more confidence throughout the terms. And the same way that we have the defendants of the consumer on one side, we could have a protection to the one that has been saving more. Because when we think about this in the long term, we need to think about this long-term savings for the country and that is in the debate more and more it would be a great opportunity for brazil for us to do this the conclusions here are that in my opinion my personal opinion more and more we have a social security regimen that is reduced more and more and that is reaching a, a smaller po uh, public, being benefited by small income, lower income, protecting a part of the future, but only for the lower income receive. And in practice, that the lower income are the ones that are being generated in the pandemic and they are employments 
they are low income type of employment. So on one side, this has to do with the employer at the origin of this, um, this contribution and uh, the common worker only having um, half of the contribution that they should have. So when we speak about this contribution, we need to work, for example, about something that is so distant for, distant for the majority of the people that they don't know uh, or they don't want to be part of this regimen. So when we propose that to them, they don't, don't want to do that because they opt to not contribute. So we're talking about a young people that are already in the market. And recently we had a work from the different employees in uh, Europe with a lower income and the elite, for example, they are able to uh, have, for example, a choice of not being linked to a company, for example. So the private companies, they are not going to continue doing this cross subsidies. What does that mean? Contrib contributing seven minimum wages or more to help the ones that are at the base of the pyramid. In Brazil, is visible. We have a concentration of income with this multinational companies because usually the branch cannot do something different than the headquarters. And the ones that are exempt of their contribution to the social security. And at the same time that this is a roof for the open social security, it's a roof for the closed social security as well. So we redimension all the levels with um, the three axes of investment that we have. So with less workers and less contributions, we have, for example, this tripod that can be more and more um, with a different way, a look to the private sector and the private social security. I just wanted to complement something here. For example, a good part, a uh, uh, good number of these contributors, they do not uh, speak to the different contributors. And they have this challenge of uh, tackling these different issues with the private sector. So in the future, they are, they are not going to pressure you with the assistance that you are supposed to give them. We are having the discussions now about what we are going to, the amount that we're going to help people with that at the end of the day is a protection because of this lack of savings that we have in the social security. So that's why we are having this high uh, cost to help uh, the majority of the contributors that cannot contribute directly to the social security. So on the other hand, 
we have this uh, challenge of being able to make a standard of this investment from the different entities that help us in the social security and that can depend less and less in, with the public debt the search for the uh, rentability is on demand and you can create opportunities that are so important for everyone and that can be managed by private companies. The challenges are huge and the opportunities as well. In Brazil, we have the opportunity of doing so much in so little time. And they are covered and detailed in such a different way. The general protection law shows, for example, discussions about the governance of the future. And I don't know if I went a little overboard in my time, but the main point here is to look at the private sector, not only as something complementary, but and not a, a supplementary, but as something that is uh, growing for the Brazilian workers as well. And I insist on that. We have little opportunities to save more and invest more to spare the Brazilian social security. Thank you so much, José Roberto Afonso. So it's, uh, thank you so much that when it's talked about challenges and opportunities, we have the taxation reform, and we know that the worker will have to do a planning in terms of uh, uh, longevity and well this new uh, worker that is a micro entrepreneur and we have to have this uh, tax benefit in some way so it's uh, we have some rules here uh, in terms of actual profit for for, for a specific uh, size of, uh, of a company. So this tributary reform that uh, we're talking in Brazil just went through this discussion in Congress. So it was capped the petition that is so important and it is international is based in the international system. The taxation is on the receipt of the benefits and, and so that uh, people will renounce the immediate consumption to enjoy a better life in the future. So I'll pass the floor to our speaker, Mrs. Jackie Wells. I have two uh, announcements. The, inscription the enrollment for the raffle is part of our site and participate and that there is a link in our chat for simultaneous translation in the international presentation by mrs jack well so i thank you and pass the floor straight to dr jackie wells Thank you, your uh, presence here. We study the United Kingdom model and all the structure and taxation scheme as we are debating, debating this in the Congress. So, well, what we have for in our constitution of 2014, there was uh, the participation of uh, Minister 
uh, Bruno, Paulo Valle, Lúcio, all of them here present with us. So to keeping this uh, article number 15, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Louis. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak at this conference. Um, and hello from the south coast of England. <clears throat> um, it, it's clear to me from, from what I've heard so far that uh, the UK and Brazil are facing many of the same challenges in, uh, in the world of pensions, a changing economy, a changing workforce that we've just heard about, um, changing demographics, uh, and a, an, an emerging new pensions landscape. Um, although the pension system in the UK is, is quite advanced, we are, we are still going through many changes. Um, and of course, uh, a big topic for us and for many others is, is the role that pensions can play in uh, climate change. Um, but I'm not going to talk about any of those today. I'm going to talk about pension taxation, um, which is uh, a little bit of a, a maybe a dry subject, but um, I will do my best to make it interesting. So uh, some slides. So um, pensions taxation. Um, is it, it's a, a perennial, uh, frequent policy debate in the UK as to how we should treat the taxation of pensions. Um, and it seems to crop up every two to three years um, and, and, and is debated um, in, in great detail by the sector. And I have spent the past 18 months working on the subject of pensions taxation in the UK um, and survived. Um, and, um, uh, and a lot of the debate about pensions taxation in the UK stems from two real factors. Um, on the one hand, uh, the, there are plenty of people who perceive the system as being regressive in nature as favoring the higher earners. Um, and the second factor, of course, is a concern about the rising cost of pensions taxation because we have this um, deferred system um, where um, it's taxed on receipt in retirement. Um, so I'm going to start by just going over a little bit of the detail of the UK system and some uh, recent reforms and a little bit, setting that a little bit in the international perspective. Um, for the last uh, 18 months, I've been working with the Pensions and Lifetime Savings Association in the UK on this subject, and uh, that's the PLSA. The PLSA is the um, representative body for pension funds in the UK, and has developed uh, some principles that, that, that uh, we would like to see applied to any discussion of pensions tax reform. And so I'll talk about those a little and how they sit alongside some of the more general principles of taxation um, that the OECD has, has, has uh, developed. And the big area of debate in the UK, I mean, there have been a lot of ch changes suggested for pensions tax, but... Um, the one that features most strongly in the debate is, is, a, is a shift towards only giving basic rate or a flat rate of tax relief to individuals rather than their full marginal uh, rate of tax. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail and in particular the impact that that could have on savers and implications for for schemes and employers. So uh, just some very basic background, um, as is the case in many countries, um, our pensions taxation uh, takes the form of EET. So that is exempt, exempt, taxed. 
um, in, in sequence, um, which means that at the moment, um, individuals' contributions to their pension and their employer pensions uh, contributions to their pensions are not taxed at the point of contribution. They are uh, tax relieved, um, but they are taxed on, on receipt in, re in, <clears throat> in retirement, or at least most of it is. So um, we, have, we have this system where employees do not pay tax on their own contributions, and they don't pay tax on the contributions made by their employer. Um, and in the case of the latter, the employer's contribution, these are also exempt from employer's national insurance and corporation tax. Uh, and so there is no, no tax at all on those uh, contributions. As funds are accumulating, most of, uh, or some of the investment returns are tax-free. It used to be the case that all of them were tax-free until uh, 1997 when the system was made more complex and some are now taxed and some aren't. Um, and then in retirement, um, uh, savers are able to withdraw 25% of their fund, their accumulated fund, um, tax-free, uh, whilst the remainder is taxed at their then tax rate. Um, so this is, this is really the main benefit, the main tax benefit for savers, um, that they can receive a quarter of their fund tax-free. And uh, for, for some, of, some people, they will have moved from a higher rate of tax during their working life to a lower rate of tax in retirement. And so there is a smoothing of their um, tax payments over their lifetime that's created by this system of EET. And there are also some quite complicated um, tax benefits that are available to beneficiaries um, of people who die with a defined contribution pension before the age of, of 75. Um, but I won't go into those in detail. Um, it is fair to say that the, the UK tax system is complex. Um, there are many details that many people who work all full-time in pensions don't, don't fully understand. And so as a result, it's really quite difficult for members of the public to understand um, the details of pensions taxation in the UK. Having said that, um, there is a widespread understanding that pensions are somehow beneficial, tax beneficial, and, and, and generally a good thing. And, and, and certainly in the UK, we have um, normalized the idea of, of, of pension savings. Um, so one of the reasons that the subject of pensions taxation has become a, a matter of debate is that both the number and the proportion of workers contributing to a pension has increased significantly since the introduction of um, automatic enrollment in, in 2012. More than 10 million employees have been newly enrolled into pensions and have stayed in pensions largely since that date. And this has led to a debate about the cost of, of pensions tax relief and moreover the the perceived inequalities of a system that is seen to reward higher earners more than lower earners. So the cost of tax relief in the UK has risen, but not at the same rate as the growth in membership of pension schemes or in contributions. So the cost of tax rate relief has risen by 22% since 2012. Um, but we've seen a doubling of the number of people in uh, saving in a pension over that time. And the reason for that disparity, that difference, is that um, automatic enrolment has mainly brought lower earners into pensions uh, than those who are already in pensions, but is also due to changes in uh, the system of tax relief that's been made by successive governments. So um, a bit more about the UK uh, system and its limits. We had a major reform of pensions taxation in 2006. 
uh, which moved us from a system of tax relief based on a percentage of contributions and the limit being the percentage of, of earnings that you could contribute to nominal limits for tax free contributions. And we have a number of different limits in place. Um, but uh, the main one is a limit of uh, £40,000 per annum or 100% of earned income if that is, is lower. Uh, so £40,000 is, I think, about US dollars or um, 300,000 Brazilian real, real. I hope I've pronounced that right. Um, and this has been, this limit has been in place since 2014, so has been affected by fiscal drag um, and, and it has not increased in real terms and it is not increasing this year either. Um, however, we've seen a number of um, important adjustments to that uh, main allowance that make the system um, arguably more progressive um, than that put in place in 2006. So non-workers, people with no income at all um, from, from earned work can contribute up to £2,880 and receive a tax rebate on that as if they were a taxpayer. Um, so there is a, a sort of bonus that's paid to those individuals if, if they can find the money to save. And those who earn below the threshold for basic rate tax can also get tax relief or a tax rebate on their own contributions, um, even if they're not paying tax. And, and that system is about to be extended um, to all types of schemes. So anyone who is not a taxpayer but is contributing will get a rebate on their contributions. And perhaps the most controversial um, or difficult um, change that's been made in recent years is to cap quite severely the contributions that can be made tax-free by very high earners. So there is a, a taper limit in place. So anyone earning in excess of 200,000, which is admittedly a lot of money, um, uh, has their pension annual allowance tapered um, to £4,000 um, uh, 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 over uh, between two, 200,000 and 240,000. And any contributions in excess of that are subject to a tax charge. So you pay tax if you contribute over the limits. However, very few savers are affected by that limit. Um, less than 1% of earners are affected by the taper and less than 15% of, 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 of earners earn ex in excess of 40,000 pounds. And of course, being able to contribute all of your income into a pension is, is unusual. So for most people, the 40,000 cap is, is uh, not a real cap. Um, so we've got two limits in place. There's the annual allowance, which limits how much you can contribute, but there's also um, something called the lifetime allowance, which limits the total pot of money that you can accumulate um, uh, that will attract tax benefits. And the lifetime allowance is currently 1.073 million pounds. So um, your pot cannot exceed that without being subject to um, a charge of 55% uh, tax on withdrawal. Um, and, and one of the consequences of this is that um, the lifetime allowance has led many very high earners and particularly senior executives in, um, in large companies and high earners in the public sector to cease being active members of pension schemes towards the end of, of their career. And that has important um, implications for the way in which um, senior executives uh, think about the way they deliver pensions to their workforce and has perhaps devalued the idea of pensions for some people. Nevertheless, it is still a small group of people who are um, affected by the lifetime allowance, um, around 3% of the working age population, or 1.25 million people. And so 
while the limits can, it can be argued that they are, are more progressive in nature, um, they're not a significant band, uh, limitation for, for most people. So this, this is just a graphical representation of the, of the um, contributions, uh, just to give you an idea of how it plays out for people with different earnings. So um, if you look at the left-hand side, this is an individual who has no earned income, so no um, earned taxable income, and they can contribute in gross terms 3,600, and if you look at the other extreme in, in this chart, someone earning £240,000, they can contribute uh, £4,000, so a very similar amount to the, the non-earner. Um, and then in the middle, we have um, those earning different bands. So someone earning £20,000 um, can contribute up to £20,000, although clearly very few people would be able to do that. So that's their cap. Um, for anyone earning £50,000, their cap is uh, the cap of the annual allowance, which is £40,000. And the same allowance applies to anyone earning up between fifty and, and £200,000. So, um, so, so the way in which the cap works is different depending on your earnings. Almost every year, um, no, every year, every year brings some change to pensions, policy and taxation. But 2006 was the most radical to date. Before 2006, the tax system was very fragmented and even more complex than today. Um, and before the reforms, contributions were generally limited by a percentage of earnings. In 2006, when the reforms took place, the annual allowance was originally set at £215,000, um, a huge figure that was way out of reach for all but a very, very small number of, of the highest earners. And similarly, the lifetime allowance has been much higher than it is now. It's, it peaked at 1.8 million in 2012. And I think it's fair to say that the biggest driver for change in the UK has been the, the desire to increase tax revenues rather than a desire to introduce a more progressive system. However, the effect has been to make the system more gradually more progressive than it was in 2006 and, and before that date. So this is the um, representation of how the lifetime allowance, which is the top line and the left-hand axis and the annual allowance, which is the lower line and the right-hand axis, have moved between 2006 and, uh, and today. Um, and you'll see that both of them have, have uh, dropped significantly. Um, the lifetime allowance started to rise with um, inflation um, from 2018, but has now been frozen until at least 2025. Um, the annual allowance has not moved since 2014 when it was reduced slightly. And you can see that the significant reductions were really made in 2011, uh, 2012, and coincided with a change of government and, and the introduction of austerity measures in, in the UK. So among... OECD countries, um, it's fair to say that the EET system of taxation is the most common. Um, we have other systems in place, so TEE, where contributions are taxed, but payments out are not, is applied in Hungary. ETT is uh, applied in Denmark, Italy and Sweden. TTE in New Zealand and TTT. Um, in Australia, although there are really very important um, uh, nuances that are at play in, in, in each of those systems. Um, and you have to look at each of them very carefully and in a lot of detail to understand uh, uh, exactly how that, that plays out for the individual and how they compare with other forms of saving. 
So one of the things I've done here is to, to, to think about the, the EET as a system of taxation in the context of the OECD principles, general principles of taxation, um, and, and particularly how they're implied in the UK. Um, so if we, if we run through these um, principles of neutrality, efficiency, certainty, and simplicity, effectiveness and fairness, flexibility, and uh, the, the, perhaps the most contentious one, equity, um, and think about how EET plays out, then I think it, it's fair to say that it meets many of the general principles. EET, as applied in the UK, is neutral um, in terms of the types of worker, um, and an attempt has been made to make it neutral across different types of schemes, although there are important differences in outcomes for members of defined benefit and members of defined contribution pension schemes. EET in the UK works largely with existing systems, although there is considerable complexity that has to be built in and compliance costs have risen and continue to rise um, with changes in policy. EET as applied in the UK is not simple. Um, and while members of direct defined contribution schemes can have some certainty over their tax system, high earners in defined benefit schemes are faced with uh, quite considerable uncertainty about the tax that they, the tax relief they'll receive and the tax that they may have to pay. EET has a number of attractive features for both the saver and for the government. Uh, for the former, for the saver, it only taxes the member when they have access to their money in retirement. And for government, it ensures that all investment growth is taxed um, ultimately at the end. TEE, by contrast, taxes the saver at a point when they can't access the money, making pensions potentially less attractive than other forms of more accessible saving. It can also result in a tax bill for the saver on the employer contribution at a point where they don't have any access to that money. And for the government, it can reduce in slightly lower tax revenues. EET is also held to, by some to be fair because it helps those with erratic earnings smooth their taxation over their lifetime. EET as applied in the UK also provides the government with flexibility, particularly in the ability to um, uh, vary the allowances and finesse the allowances, uh, a fiscal tool that um, successive governments have used here. The one significant area of debate uh, concerns whether or not EET as applied in the UK delivers equity, particularly vertical equity um, between different uh, types of earners. So while under, while even under EET, high earners will ultimately pay the most tax, it's also the case that they receive the most tax-free cash and benefits, and they're most likely to benefit from smooth, smoothing of their taxation. The PLSA, um, has developed its own set of principles um, that it asks government to consider when looking at possible reforms to the pensions taxation system. Uh, and these, these principles were the result of a, a year-long exercise in reviewing the potential impact of changes in pensions taxation. The first and most important principle um, for the PLSA is that pensions tax relief should promote adequate pensions. Um, by providing financial support for long-term saving. A switch to a different system, such as TEE, for example, could have a detrimental effect on adequacy of pensions in retirement, and um, particularly uh, if, it, if it taxes uh, employer contributions. The PLSA has argued that the government should not damage the success of automatic enrolment by reducing the value of tax relief in the pension system. Secondly, any system and reforms must be easy to understand and should not put barriers 
in the way <coughs> of helping people make the right decision about saving for retirement. While there's not widespread understanding of pensions tax relief, a major change could nevertheless damage people's willingness to save. The third principle is potentially the most contentious because fairness can be a personal judgment or construct, and it's difficult to separate from the concept of equity between different groups of workers. However, the PLSA was clear that any system should treat different types of workers in broadly the same way. Changes to pensions taxation can be complex and costly for schemes for employer to, employers to adapt, adopt. And ultimately these costs are, are felt by the members of the scheme and by customers of employers. Any changes to the system, to the system should help, should keep transition and ongoing costs to a minimum. And finally, the PLSA feels that it's important for any changes to be as sustainable as possible. While some of the changes considered by the PLSA in its analysis would be relatively simple to implement, it also follows that they would be simple for future governments to unpick, adding to the uncertainty of outcomes for savers, schemes and employers. And it was felt important that savers in particular had confidence that a future government would not be able to tax their savings twice. The work carried out by the PLSA came about in part because of the ongoing debate about the fairness of the UK tax system, pensions tax system, um, and also allied to a view that um, in this period of time, the government uh, would be looking to raise tax revenues um, and particularly looking for ways of doing that without breaking its, uh, its uh, manifesto promises not to raise the level of general taxation. A number of different solutions uh, were explored, including those listing here, listed here. So we considered a change to TEE, limiting the tax-free cash to a nominal amount, uh, applying different rules to defined benefit and defined contribution, limiting tax relief to, and the, finally limiting tax relief to basic rate tax only. That's the lowest rate of, of tax in the UK. Uh, we concluded that all reforms would come with some degree of, of cost, complexity and uncertainty. Uh, TEE would remove the incentive to lock money away until retirement. Limiting the tax-free cash would add considerable complexity and reduce the attractiveness of pensions to many. Different regimes for DB and DC would be perceived as widely, widely as unfair and inequitable. And a flat rate of, of tax relief only would be complex for both schemes and employers to implement and would, could result in some double taxation for some people. I'm not going to go into the detail of this chart, but uh, I think you can see from the ticks and the crosses that uh, none of the proposed reforms or none of the reforms that we considered um, were thought to be an improvement on the current system, um, which itself is far from perfect. Um, let, if we look at the example for exa of, of the bottom line here, a shift to TEE, this reform in particular failed to meet any of the, the principles. It would potentially reduce the amount of money flowing into pensions. It could discourage uh, some people from saving uh, in reti for retirement. It would be difficult to apply fairly between DB and DC. It would be very complex for schemes and employers to administer, particularly if leg legacy schemes had to continue under the existing regime, and particularly if applied to DB schemes. And it was questioned whether it would be sustainable and whether people would believe that it was sustainable, uh, given the temptation of future governments to tax benefits in payment. The reform that we spent most time considering was a shift to a single rate of tax relief, the basic rate of tax. And with the help of the Pensions Policy Institute, PPI, we modeled the impact on different types of saver. The results 
here show the clear winners and losers of a shift of this kind. On the left-hand side of the chart, this individual here, uh, we called Sam. Uh, he or she is a, a very low earner, um, a non-taxpayer, um, and they would benefit particularly from a boost to their pensions, particularly if they were in a DC scheme. Uh, in a DB scheme, the boost would be less, but a DB scheme would pay a much higher pension anyway, which would make them taxable in retirement. At the other end, we have the biggest losers. So Ronnie here is our big loser in both DC and in a DB scheme. Uh, this individual would lose um, around 20% 20, 20 of their uh, pension in retirement by a shift to basic rate tax relief only. In the middle, we have two, indiv two other individuals. Alex is a basic rate taxpayer. So the change to basic rate tax relief only would not affect Alex. Now, Alex represents something like 80% of all taxpayers in the UK. So most taxpayers would not see a change. The one, the, the example that we were, we were a little surprised about was we tried to model an individual who was either very close to being a higher rate taxpayer or was sometimes a higher rate taxpayer. And, and this is the example here, Jamie, who, who loses out, loses between 10 to 20% of their uh, retirement income. So he was one of the ex, ex, unexpected losers. We also spent a lot of time talking to schemes and employers um, and payroll professionals and systems people about the implications of, of a single rate, a flat rate of tax relief uh, on schemes and employers. And um, for both groups, both for schemes in administering the pensions and for employers in working through the payroll, uh, it was felt that there would be very considerable changes uh, potentially very expensive changes that would have to be made uh, to systems and uh, to pension systems and to payroll. And the potential to disrupt quite significantly um, automatic enrolment um, and to create quite a lot of discontent amongst staff um, and potentially disrupt benefits uh, packages in, in particularly in large employers. So, um, in summary, the UK system of pensions tax relief is claimed by some to be uh, regressive. Um, and, but as I hope I've shown, um, there are a number of features of the UK system that mitigate this position, albeit that many were introduced for other reasons, um, and that some of that mitigation doesn't really affect uh, anything other than a very small number of, of earners, high earners. Having explored the potential changes to the system, it is clear to us that any change would come at a very considerable cost and disruption with the potential to damage the success of automatic enrollment and to introduce claims of inter intergenerational unfairness. While the UK system has its faults, the conclusion of the PLSA analysis was that fundamental reform of the system would not be in anyone's interests. And to date, thankfully, the government in the UK appears to agree with this analysis. Um, whether it stays that way is, uh, is open to debate. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Um, and I am happy to take questions either now or through email later on if you have any. Thank you. We thank you so much, Ms. Jackie Wells. We know that this is so complimentary here in Brazil and it's not, uh, the supplementary pension is not easy here in Brazil. This is a worldwide concept, but in Brazil especially, this uh, has been followed uh, by the OECD principles. We are trying really hard to be fitting in this pattern. Uh, and other, 
by Jose Roberto as well in this wind of love opportunities is important for us to invest in this more and more with public policies that really can increment this in the long term. And as it was said in our chat, what is, is, is important for us to do? The social security education, we need to educate people about this, but uh, aliquot zero for those who spare money over time, who save money over time. So we need to allow the citizens to be benefiting as well. And as it was said with different project of infrastructures as well, let's uh, help this person save uh, with a liquid zero. This is one of the proposals that we have in Abrap. Um, I'm sorry because we cannot continue discussing to, because of the time, but it was really amazing. We really enjoyed your presentation and we would like to thank you so much. We are going to answer the rest of the questions that were left in the chat afterwards by email. And once again, our raffle is over. Uh, and in the last two minutes, you can still subscribe to the next raffles that we're going to have. Now, José Roberto is going to talk about May. May was an attempt to formalize the informal people. Uh, was it successful or not? What do you think? Was it successful, Zé? Well, I think that May was not an attempt, is a reality, because a regimen that has more than 10 million micro uh, entrepreneurs, just after the pandemic, we had more than 1 million of them that were inserted in this system. So I think that when it comes to formalization of the work, it's really working well. Obviously, you have a parcel of the population that has have opted to continue being um, the ones that are not paying taxes. But in my point of view, it's it has uh, been really good for and its main a uh, main purpose was to was to formalize and it was good. So uh, we still have some people that default, but we were able to connect May with uh, Simples Nacional and the other systems of uh, tax collection. And uh, in this change of one taxation regimen to the next, you, we don't want to make people uh, understimulated with that. And in my point of view as well, we are working with a pr proposal to make a difference between May and the Simples Nacional from the popcorn maker until the uh, computer program programmer. We have different realities of these uh, professionals, but I think that they can all be treated uh, in, in, their, in, a, in a unique manner. Each one of them have unique values starting from the basic social uh, security until the private social security and uh, the lowest income employees they are not able to save uh, a lot but there is uh, there are professionals that can do that and that is the amount of people that we need to focus on with more regularity of income and that can save more, not only contributing to the social security, but also the other secu social securities that you've mentioned before. This entire discussion that we have and the companies are awarded by the tax system in Brazil and there's different funds that we create created as part of the project. And the people that are outside the real profit, more than 90% of the employees, they don't have this 
style. But when we start discussing this, then the social inequalities, income inequalities, and uh, part of this public policies start from where we we started today discussing in the seminars to understand how the social security is organized and um, trying to find solutions together. And I continue insisting there is a small amount of companies, I think it's 180,000 of them that are able to save and work in this way in this regimen. For the other workers, the ones that are not able to save, it's fundamental for us to review the taxation so that is a, a stimulation to savings, especially the social security and the long term. Thank you once again, Zé Roberto and Jackie Wells. As well, we have selected one question for you that involves the topic that we have been discussing a lot here in Brazil, the automatic subscription of the citizens to these different plans. And uh, for the question is, taken to a very interesting um, direction, which is the following. If the social security was compulsory for all, there wouldn't be a problem of having a taxation incentive. What do you think? And then um, the question is, do you know any studies uh, comparing different countries that have systems with of uh, fiscal incentive and without fiscal incentive? Oh, um, so uh, the first part of your question, automatic enrollment and compulsion. Um, in the UK, we favor the voluntary, semi-voluntary um, system, and we have found that it works very well. Um, but um, as you say, if it, if it were compulsory and in Australia, um, the, it is compulsory um, and the level of contribution required is much higher than the UK. It's about 50% higher than the UK. Um, and, and the tax incentives, um, as I understand it, have been largely removed. But I think what Australia finds is because there are differences between uh, the taxation of pensions and the taxation of property, um, that creates some, uh, some different behaviors and tensions um, that have very different, that, that can create very different outcomes in retirement. Um, in terms of um, comparison, um, there are, uh, there are a number of, of reports um, and there is a, a, an OECD comparison of different, uh, uh, of different systems <clears throat> that I think is quite a, quite a good read. Um, I can send details of that across uh, to the team later on if need be. Um, yeah, and, and I think in the, in the UK, we are still debating whether tax relief can really work as an incentive for people to save. And our, our feelings are that it works well for the higher earners. It works less well for the lower earners. Um, but that is um, partly because they, 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 it's a difficult concept to understand. And people don't understand that they get tax relief when they contribute and it gets taxed when uh, when they retire and take their pension. Um, so it, I think it, it's whether, whether it really acts as an incentive and makes people save more, I think is debatable. But I, equally, I think if you take it away, 
it could act as a very strong disincentive to save for many people. So I think you you know it's it's not a case of um, if it's not an incentive, take it away and it won't matter. I think it it, it would make a very big difference to people's behaviour. So um, I hope that answers some of your question anyway. Very well, very well. Thank you so much. Uh, we are a little bit over the time. And I wanted to ask some questions, but I'm not going to have the opportunity to do so. So I'm so sorry about that. Um, it was a great conversation. It was a technical conversation and it was an interesting conversation. Thank you so much for the invitation to be participating here in this event. And all of the questions, once again, that we were not able to answer will be followed up in, by email. So. I would like to pass the floor to the organization now because they're going to do the raffle and uh, say that it's an honor for me to be here learning with all of you. Thank you. We congratulate you and all of the panelists for the great presentations and the moderation. And we invite you to be here in the next days of the event. Now we take advantage of the time to also remind you for those that uh, were not answered, the questions that were made and not answered, they're going to be send you the email uh, and as I said before, we're going to do the raffle. So now let's share the screen. The two winners uh, of the raffle were Maria de Lourdes Noronha Machado and Salete Beatriz Conzel Guimarães. Congratulations, you both. We're going to enter in contact with both of you. And uh, then we're going to send the address that you can talk to us with. Okay, so today we have ended our first first day of the seminar. We thank you very much for the participation and we will extend the thanks for our sponsors and supporters. The links of access are different for each day of event. So please pay attention to the emails that we're going to send you. And the links are going to be available in the website of the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. Have a great afternoon and we will see each other once again tomorrow.